happens when a woman takes power? What happens when she won't back down? What happens when a woman takes power? What happens? What happens? What happens when a woman takes power? What happens when she won't back down? Good morning, everyone. Welcome, Yensina Larson, CEO, founder of World Pulse, to the Magnolia Moonshot 2030. We're so excited to have you here today. And I, I just have to share my personal connection to Yensina. I met you at Nike many, many years ago now. And I can remember having lunch that first time. And you asked me to join your board of directors, uh, which I did. I had the honor of serving for a few years. And most recently, Yensina was a fellow in the first cohort of the Academy for Systems Change Fellowship Program. So we are so honored to have you here today. And Yensina, we'd love to just hear a little bit about your story. How did you start? What, what opportunity or gap or problem did you see? How did you approach it? Just if you could just share a little bit about your story with us. Hmm. Thank you, Darcy. And just a little bit about the truth about who I am is uh, that every single cell in my body, my life has been a quest in how to create the digital infrastructure that can truly connect women's voices around the world and, and, and bring greater global power together. And so I know we share, all of us in this circle here today, the, the, the ambition and, and, and the vision for, for big global change and what that's going to take. And my life has been a quest to reconcile the fact that women, women's leadership, is a great accelerator and technology is a great accelerator. So I believe if you put them both together, you're gonna get a, a, a massive rocket boost to global change. So uh, today I'd love to share, I'll share a little bit about my story of how I started. Uh, Darcy asked me to share also, you know, some of my learnings through my journey in particular, how do you build an, an online enabling environment that really evokes voice where before there was silence and and then some of the, the future plans and and the, the 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 ecosystem building that that we're doing with world pulse and many many other partners so i'll, I'll share some of my journey and i have a couple of, of slides just to to get us into that space one other quick grounding that i want to do before i share the beginnings of my journey is I'm sure all of us are feeling this very electric moment right now, feeling it very much in our bones of the urgency that has been accelerated through the pandemic because of course, it was a hundred years to gender equity at our current pace before the pandemic. And now um, if we look at that is being shoved back actually by generations. So the last count was 135 years, just erased in one year. We've been set back by a generation. So this is a picture of where I grew up. This is the behind the barn in rural Wisconsin. I grew up uh, very shy in the countryside. I was homeschooled and I knew this, I had this experience of my voice burning inside me and kind of that trapped feeling, especially whenever I was in, in public situations. And my solace was to grab an armful of books and just lay out a blanket behind the barn and read. My father was a librarian, so he would, he would give me stacks of books that was his love. And I would read folk tales about the world. I, I read tales of Diary of Anne Frank, the Trail of Tears of Indigenous Genocide. I read, had some heavy stuff also, and I just, knew I wanted to see the truth of the world and, and, and find ways to, to get through the pain to solutions. And as I grew up, I knew I just had to go out and see the world. So at 19 years old, I took off and I went to the Ecuadorian Amazon and I worked there with indigenous communities and women who are struggling with oil contamination on their traditional lands. And their children were dying of various cancers, skin cancers, stomach cancers. And they were saying to me, please carry our stories to the world. And I became a, a, a journalist 
an international journalist from that experience. And uh, I went then to the Burma Thai border, also known now as Myanmar. And the stories that I was witnessing there were uh, ethnic cleansing, mass rape, which of course, as we know, is, is, is going on today and, and has gotten actually worse in the last few months. But at the time, I just held my microphone and there was like something that was so enormously sacred of that act of just asking a woman what her vision was. And at sometimes she'd never even been asked that question, but to step back and, and hear what came out and the, the, the enormous wisdom and deep, deep knowledge of what was needed for the country was so present and the way her, it was, a, it was like a, this pulse of, of hope that came through her as she started to talk. But still, the vision for World Pulse came for me actually one night. It was a hot, sticky night and I was sleeping under the stars. I was actually on a bamboo mat and I was feeling incredibly heavy because I'd just been absorbing all these stories. And, and actually I was feeling almost hopeless. I was saying to myself, you know, I know these stories are medicine for the world, but who's gonna listen? Who's listening to these stories? I can publish them as a journalist, but, but what is really gonna happen? And I was tossing and turning and I looked up at the stars in between uh, wakefulness. And somehow, you know, when you're, you get struck by lightning, that, that saying you get struck by lightning, for me, it was the stars pulsed at me. And it was this blue pulsing light that was in the shape of a globe. And as I looked at it, I knew what I was seeing was the, the light of a woman's voice unlocking and it and activated another light and another light and another light. And this building pulse just kept growing. And it was so beautiful, this blue light. And I just knew at that moment that, that I was being shown the way forward and that it wasn't just about voice, but it was about connected voice. And we had to find a way to connect the voices of, of women across the planet so that was the vision that was given to me. And I had no idea how to make that happen. I was, <laughs> I was absolutely, uh, you know, still shy, had no, no resources. Um, I didn't even know really what I, what the, the manifestation of this was to be, but I knew that I could no longer be a journalist. I could no longer be a messenger for these extraordinary women, but the world needed a communication platform where these women could speak for themselves to the world and where they could connect to no longer feel so alone. So even though I had no idea what form or shape this would take, I knew it had to happen. I went back to the United States and I, I, I waited for somebody else to do it. I, I waited for years. I thought, okay, this is the way, but somebody else is gonna do it who knows more than me, who, who is seasoned in media and global work and they're gonna do it, nobody did. So finally, it was like that voice that crawling up my throat, like just bursting, burning, burning inside, <laughs> this burning vision. And I said, at 28 years old, I said, okay, I just have to do this. There's, um, you know, it's worse, it's more painful to not do this and to not see this in the world. So I, I, I started um, along this incredible navigating journey of, of how to bring this vision to life with lots and lots of ups and downs. And, but that's the origin story of World Pulse. That's amazing, Ancina. So you saw what was needed. And I, I just love what you said about, you know, stories are medicine for the world. Could you tell us a little bit about, you, you know, the ups and downs that you faced when you hit a, a barrier or you got stuck. And as you know, systems leaders acknowledge that they don't have all the answers. And you just mentioned that. But when you did get stuck, how did you move beyond that? Well, <laughs> it's funny how your biggest work in the world, your biggest vision is your own work on your own self and your own, your own voice. And, and so I'll tell you another story that completely <laughs> um, changed my life in this journey. And so, so 
to rewind back to when first starting World Pulse, it actually started as a print magazine and pushed really hard. And what I had to learn was that, you know, it, it, you just, you gr I grounded out <laughs> as a social entrepreneur and I figured out everything. I learned how to, you know, work with writers around the world and source them from remote, remote locations. I learned how to do publishing, independent publishing and launch that business. I learned how to build a website. I, I learned how to, you know, everything from soup to nuts, all the, the copy editing and building a, a volunteer team. I started with, I raised my first $400,000 through $50 and $100 checks in women's living rooms and starting in Portland and then to Denver and then Seattle and, and just kept expanding out from there. But I really had to learn everything from managing cash flow and starting, starting to bring on a team in those early days. But what, a, what was a, a big learning for me was um, how to completely pivot something when there was, there was just no support. So I decided at in 2008 that the print magazine, while we could keep going with it, great, awesome. People were loving it. It was best newsstand sales, um, high, highest level newsstand sales for a new publication at the time and was winning different awards. And I just knew that we actually had to take it online and that the print magazine wasn't the future. And I was learning about the, the web 2.0 and I, I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about technology, but I just knew intuitively that's where we had to go uh, because we were getting messages from, from women all over the world, from the um, forests of Colombia, from villages in Pakistan and they were saying please tell our story and we just didn't have enough page space for all the stories and other women were writing and saying I never heard about stories from Iraq so would you um, I, I want to connect to these these leaders I'm reading about directly and I, I knew the way forward was through the web well at the time our board this was pre-Darcy <laughs> But at the time, you know, the board was really very wedded to the print magazine um, and, and they couldn't see it. It was really hard. It was a time when everybody, if you were in the tech space, people were saying tech's going to change the world. This Web 2.0 era is transformational, but nobody was talking about women inside of that. Why women? Why would it matter? On the global women's rights space, they were saying uh, we absolutely um, have to empower women around the world, have women's leadership will make the difference. But tech was very amorphous. It was very hard to grasp. It was like, I don't, we don't understand this. So, so I got a lot of pushback and, and actually had to let go of the whole team at the time and do a lot of soul searching and rebuild a whole new board and, and find new funders who, when, when people from the, who were funding before didn't necessarily understand. So that was a really, really deep, um, painful moment of moving towards what I knew had to happen, but it was really hard. And then as World Pulse, Pulse started going and we were figuring it out, like it was the opposite of a Zuckerberg approach. It was not like, let's go for growth, let's build this and go for growth. Um, it was about, let's build this and ensure that the online space is a temple for women's voices, that it is evoking the shyest voice. And instead of let's build this for advertising and commercialization of data, it was like, let's design this for greatest impact to facilitate the kinds of connections that are going to actually ch change women's lives who've never before been heard. And so we, we literally were in these scrappy notebooks, drawing out the rooms. We had a, a, an amazing but very ragtag and partly volunteer team who had never done this before as well. And we just were, were we were building and cobbling this platform together from our imaginations and the stakes felt so high. I had no idea if it was going to work. So I remember this one moment that was a turning point for me. I was up late. I was totally strung out as a social, you know, you're working 24 seven and probably it was two in the morning. I had been watching the website because voices were starting to pop on from different parts of the world. It was maybe in the first few, few weeks of launching the site. And I suddenly hear this ping of a Skype ping at the time. 
And I look down and I see the name of a uh, Leia, Leia Okeyo, who I had been reading her stories just before on World Pulse. And I knew that she was writing us in the midst of election violence in Kenya. I knew she had just been writing about how her neighborhoods were being burned. There was gunfire uh, around her house. Her daughter just escaped, almost getting shot, going out for water. This woman had HIV AIDS. She was uh, caring for 14 other women who also had HIV AIDS and in a very precarious situation. And she was messaging me. Mm-hmm. And I just, I looked down, I kind of held my breath and I thought, oh, she's, she's found me on Skype. She's reaching out to me directly as the founder. And she just says, Yancina, zoom off to bed. It's so late. You must rest. Don't worry. I'm carrying the flame. And it was this moment, it's hard to describe even now, of this, rele- this release off of my shoulders and just realizing that here was, a, here was a woman who had gone to more funerals in the last week, probably, than I'd been in my, in my life. And she was there for me. And she was going to carry this vision forward. And that I could actually go to bed because <laughs> somebody else was carrying this vision. And I just, I realized that here I was, I had been building something so that women globally would not feel alone. And I had been feeling terribly alone in this work and that I had been carrying the weight of women around the world on my shoulders that I I was going to be this this the savior of that and I you know Leo kept going and she said Yancina do you realize this is going to be the site where the presidents are going to come to test the security and insecurity of women and children and I saw then too that globally women we're even going to have a bigger vision than I, <laughs> than I, and that it was only going to grow and be better with, with these other visions. So part of what I learned, Darcy, in that is, is that in, in building a vision, it's you, 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 you're building your own network around you at the same time. And, and that is going to support you and sustain you for this to be something that's sustainable. And so to this day, every step of the way, somehow I created a communication feedback loop. So in any decision that we've ever made at World Pulse, we can tap into and get the leadership of our whole global network. We can crowdsource the intelligence from our network. And we know what's in the hearts and minds of women and girls globally. You know, and I can tell more about World Pulse and how it works. Um, but we, we hear the most intimate, intimate stories and the real reality of what's happening behind the headlines. So when we're designing the platform and we're saying, oh, should we build this feature or not? Those leaders are telling us yes or no. If we're saying, should we launch this crowdsource campaign on girls' education or digital inclusion? What are, what are the most pressing issues where you want your voices heard? We can hear from them. So I learned that even though the problems that are facing the world are enormously, enormously complex. That actually it's incredibly simple. And that the number one thing that you need to do that will get you to the solution is to talk to those that are most impacted by the problem and to talk to women and girls who are are facing it, who are living it and their ideas and their solutions. And if you actually bring many voices together, you get an exchange uh, you get a greater intelligence that was even there before in isolated individual women leaders. And I call this phenomenon crowdsourcing the feminine intelligence of the planet as technology speeds up. Um, and this picture, this is a, a real life, this is like the blue lights of the vision. And this is a real day in World Pulse with the connections happening across the world. This is the, this is the reality of what's happening on, on World Pulse today. But as we go forward into the future, what technology is going to do is, is, is facilitating, it is facilitating this rapid exchange of, of knowledge and solutions for better or for worse. And if we lean into and if we build and design and consciously, consciously create for the feminine leadership and feminine voices, we're going to have this, this global intelligence that has not before been born on the planet is going to arise. 
that will help us get faster to solve global challenges. So I believe that really deeply. And that just came, and, you know, I had to learn that myself for my own life and for World Pulse by listening and by connecting. That's absolutely amazing, Yensina. Um, you've talked about education, health, equity. Uh, as you know, I've shared with you that the Magnolias were really focused on climate justice, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, equity in all forms. And Roberta Baskin, uh, who you know, is all about the SDGs. And I know Roberta's got a question. Roberta, over to you. Oh, thank you, Darcy and Yancina. Actually, first I have to just do an unsolicited testimonial to your work. I loved hearing about your quest. I've been the beneficiary of a workshop in San Francisco as a woman um, in terms of technology, you know, feeling like I have gremlins around me a lot of the time, and, and you really helped me. Um, you have such a big quest and vision and and strike me as a kind of prima ballerina in your grace in terms of you know taking on these these big challenges and making it look easy and you know women a lot of women are challenged by technology and and i'm thinking about the extra barrier that you have with world pulse I mean, such an amazing brand and and you know effort um, and I'm wondering about just the cultural challenges that you have, you know, when you're working around the world where technology is not always easy to access. So can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. And thank you for being right. <laughs> yes, thank you, Roberta, and for, for all that you're leading as well. And that, that, is the, that is the question of the day uh, in terms of how are we going to bring half of the world population online because the, the reality is half of the world's women are offline today and I don't know, don't know if all of you realize that but the the it primarily in in low to middle income countries are the biggest gaps and we see that even what for those women and girls that are online there's also a very real digital gender divide happening online in terms of knowledge of skills and confidence to use the web and you alluded to it roberta it's stunning to me that even in the United States, wherever I go, there's this internal track that women have about technology in our own heads. And I invite you all to, to notice that when that's happening. But of, you know, I'm a Luddite or I, I'm stupid around tech or tech is bad and dangerous and I need to get away from it. <laughs> and there's, there's a victim mentality happening that, that doesn't isn't that track isn't there so much for, for, for many men, but it really is very prevalent. And it's, um, we're abdicating our power with technology, which is, it really is one of the most powerful tools that we have in front of us to, to immediately make, make a difference, make a connection and amplify our voice. So we have the power to do our own balance and our own well-being, but we also have the power to make change with that. So that's, that track is playing out around the world for the, even those women and girls who are online. Now, you asked about the barriers and, and, and the bridge. And so what I just wanted, uh, again, share a couple of slides to, to ground us in the real stats and what World Pulse has uncovered. And I can, of course, share a couple of real stories about this, which sometimes the stories are a little bit more fun than the stats. But the gender divide, as I spoke about, is very, very serious all the way across the spectrum. So from accessing the internet to once you get online and actually using the internet to those that are making the internet and building it. And it's even the numbers go down to single digits in there. And then on top of that, there's the dangers of online. Beyond the divide, the, the online cyber violence is spiking now in COVID and it was going up already, but uh, there's a bunch of new reports that have come out in World Pulse. We just did our own crowdsource report on online cyber violence, but in general, about 50% of women and girls, including adolescent girls, sadly, have experienced some form of cyber violence or cyber, cyber harassment or cyber blackmail. The pace in which online platforms are responding to that is abysmally slow. Now, 
It's also incredibly destabilizing as we can see for democracies. And it creates this downward pressure for, um, for women's leadership and for democracy. For, so for example, 73% of women journalists globally have experienced severe online violence, you know, rape threats, death threats. It's higher for those women that are running for office. And you just get a barrage of, 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 of hate and toxicity. So, so think about those that are actually out there being journalists or running for office, but then think about the chilling effect that that has for those that would maybe otherwise run for office or go into journalism. It's, a, it's, it's freezing the field, it's freezing and suppressing women's leadership globally, which as we know, is one of the primary keys for solving all global challenges, but also for in the coronavirus, women's leadership around the world. Women were at the helms of heads of state or running in, leading in parliament that they were, um, those countries fared better, peace and security, climate change, you name it. So, so the online violence is very real and is a barrier for women coming online. Now you have this enormous opportunity for greater reach at the click of a button, you can reach into the nooks and crannies of the world that you wouldn't normally, enormous opportunity for education, for economic advancement, um, and for voice, for, for those stories that never before have been heard that can be surfaced. So we talked about the SDGs and I call goal 5B the booster goal. So remember goal 5B because it's my favorite goal and that is women's enabling access to tech. And I call it the booster goal because I do believe if we do build this as a plank and as a priority in the global women's movements, it's really gonna boost goal five of gender equity. And goal five, as we know, is a major booster to all the other goals. So I think this is a really, really important lever. So cultural change. What we've seen is that the women who are coming to World Pulse, I call them wire, these wired women leaders. They are the ones who have fought tooth and nail to get access to the internet, even if their community doesn't have access or they're working with communities that are, that are illiterate or offline. So there's a phenomenon where these leaders that are so steeped in their cultures and in their communities, they're so um, passionate about lifting up those communities is that they want to help bring the voices online from their communities. They want to bring women and girls the benefits of the web that they've got, they've gotten through World Pulse, getting a sense of, wow, you know, my voice matters and I can, there's a global community that cares about me. There's opportunity for me to be heard. There's, there's resources out there for me. All the benefits of the web that they've gotten, they want to bring to their communities. And they're really, really pissed about the fact that their communities don't have access to the internet. And they're going to the mat to fight for no social norm change. They're working with religious leaders. They're working with men and families to change minds that yes, you may be afraid that girls cannot, um, girls shouldn't be going to cyber cafes because it's too dangerous or, um, a cell phone is not something that a woman or a girl should ever have, or all the different barriers that girls don't even matter to get educated. They shouldn't have technology in their hands because they're not worth investing in. So they're, they're fighting all those social norms at the same time that they're introducing technology into their communities. And they upload these voices and solutions from their communities and then they're downloading knowledge resource and collaborations and this is i call it also a daisy chain methodology the daisy chain methodology that we're seeing our community use is so resourceful and ingenious so if i'm going out into the rural delta of nigeria or if i'm working with the fisher women in costa rica or in the south bronx where there's very little internet access and they don't have regular internet access, well then I'm gonna take information about COVID or um, you know, the elections that are happening and I'm gonna broadcast it on the radio or I'm gonna translate, translate it into an SMS for SMS phones because they don't have that, that internet access. And they're, they're, they're creating this daisy chain 
communications methodology of getting information out. And then they may go out into the, with blind communities in Cameroon in the midst of a civil war and, and videotape the voices of women and girls, do transcriptions, do interviews, collect data, and then they go back to their um, community center or to their home where they have internet access and they upload that. And that phenomenon is something that World Pulse is building on. And, and we have a network of 130 digital ambassadors to formalize this methodology that they're doing at, across 30 countries. And we're building a network of 20,000 digital ambassadors in every region of the world over the next five years that can, can, can reach at, at least 40 million by, by the counts, by the impact reach and counts of our current digital ambassador network. They're agents of digital inclusion. They're, they, many times you hear people say, okay, we just have to connect the world. We're gonna plow a ton of money. We're gonna get broadband access. We're gonna work with governments. We're gonna launch academies for digital skilling. That's all well and good, but guess who gets left out? The widows who are saying, this isn't for me. I'm not gonna come out to a digital skilling program. The adolescent girls who are forced to be at home within the four walls of their compound in, in India. You, you um, the indigenous communities who it's not in their language and they're not going to be reached out to. So, so the most marginalized of these communities are not getting the benefits of the web, but guess who knows them and can get to them and, and build and cares about them and is invested in this community. It's these local digital community-based trainers. So they're agents of digital inclusion. I think they're the key to how we're going to break through these cultural norms and how we're going to um, bring more women and girls online. <laughs> no, that was a long answer, but I just wanted to put all those pieces together. Yeah, no, it was so helpful. And I hope that you'll share your slides with us too. They're really uh, empowering. And the only other thing is I, I just want to pay homage to uh, sort of highlight something that you said that was so beautiful that being a temple for women's voices, that is not something that you would hear a man say. <laughs> and it really speaks to um, our interest in spirituality as well and, and the soft power of women. So thank you for all you're doing, Yensina. Thank you. And I, I just want to underscore, uh, this is going to stick, that the SDG goal number five, gender equity, is the booster goal for all the others. And I love your 5B booster goal to five. That's amazing. That is so well put. Um, I want to flip it over to Laura. She's got a question for you, Yancina. Hi, Yancina. That's, wow, this is a really fascinating presentation. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, so you, you started to get into kind of your, I guess you could call it logic model technically, or your, your vision of the lever of change here. And if I understand correctly, what you're saying is, you know, these women that don't have access to the incredible explosion of information and resources that the web has enabled, if you get them that access, their power to transform their own communities their own families, their own countries is going to be enormous, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I wonder if you could like um, even take a step back from that and go back to what you said at the beginning of the conversation where you gave this chilling you know, statement that it's going to take us 100 years to achieve gender equity. Um, you know, so so what do you what do you mean when you say gender equity and how does this empowerment of women um, and, and access to the knowledge and resources the web provides uh, shift that trajectory and get us closer to that goal sooner. Maybe walk us through. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great, great. So what do we mean by gender equity? How, uh, what's the logic model for how we can actually truly accelerate global change and get us, get us um, you know, speed things up? Great, okay, well, um, I have, <laughs> I, there's there's a logic model around World Pulse, and I can tell a little bit more about how World Pulse works and how we um, accelerate. We call it a, a 
a digital leadership accelerator that we've created our platform and it's not just a platform but the community around it and world pulse is a part of an ecosystem of many other players and i do a lot of and the cat being a part of the academy has been an incredible gift to me because it's enabled me to look up above beyond world pulse but look at this whole ecosystem and how do we connect the dots to 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 truly get some massive change going on here so i do have a vision around that and uh, i will uh, share a, the <laughs> the model here again with a couple more slides i'm kind of going to bring us into the state um, what we have for the global women's movement is centuries, centuries of not just chronic investment, but massive suppression and violence against women and girls. So what you have is you've got lots of, lots of little, um, lots of little organizations and community-based organizations. It's not so easy in the global women's space to say, we're just going to do a merger of the top five and we bring them together and we're gonna connect all the women of the world. It's just, you can't do that. And while there's enormous strength in this diversity, you know, from an ecosystem perspective, this is like, wow, you've got so much local leadership and local adaptations in virtually every community, but it's a task to actually link them and bring them together systematically. And, and of course, all the barriers around tech as we talked about before. So. I have, um, um, but I do want to point through, we're seeing these moments of hope. Like, so if you think about, even with little investment in women and little investment in tech and women, even less, look at these movements over the last few years, whether it's Neo Nomenos, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, just to name a few. These have been some of the biggest movements of our time. They have been started by women and they have, um, had huge cultural impact and cascading into policy and policy impacts and some shifts of power and influence as well. Now, I really believe we've only seen the tip of the iceberg, really, truly in this. And because this is coming out with very little concentrated investment and focus in feminist platforms, um, women's digital organizing, and um, so what is actually possible. So I, I've created this, it's called a, a digital women's leadership ladder. I think Roberta is probably familiar with this, but it's, it's basically a, uh, how we can create this escalator effect <laughs> to lift more women leaderships faster. And so you actually, number one is the access issue. So working with, you know, strengthening this, this army, this ground force of digital trainers that, by the way, can provide career building and income potential as well, um, as well as all the other components of access from the broadband and the, the, the hardware and all of that. But we need to start getting more masses of women online and we need to do that faster. And then once women and girl, more women and girls are online, and they're certainly critical mass today, it's about that, where are they going? Where, where, where are the spaces for them where they can truly organize that are enabling? And World Pulse is one of those enabling hubs that has been designed from a, a feminist perspective, from the co-design with women at a global level. But there are other platforms out there that support advocacy, that support online education. And so I'm at work curating a, 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 a nodes of different hubs to connect to each other because this is not, it's not about one platform that's gonna solve the world. It's not about bring every woman to just, you know, a change.org or pantsuit nation. <laughs> it's not about that. It's about multiple hubs that actually talk to each other and that will bring greater resiliency and be less prone to a takedown attack because believe me, there are plenty of attacks and hacks happening. So there's security in having multiple hubs with different strengths, multiple networks, but they are absolutely critical. And so you need, I call this coordinated connected voice infrastructure. You see this gray bar below. So you do need a thoughtful infrastructure that's coordinated, that's curated, that's invested in, but you're actually, as you bring more women girls online, you can unlock voice. You can unlock organizing. You can unlock m m much massive um, 
doorways are open to, to faster education where young girls in Pakistan can't necessarily go to school or Afghanistan because their schools might get bombed. Um, but through a cell phone, they could take a program on coding. And that's exactly what girls in Afghanistan are. They're winning coding awards and AI awards and robotic awards because they're logging online through their mobile phones. But was the Taliban going to educate them in a formal school? No. So at the click of a button, if you're enabling these pathways where she can, she can live her dreams, she can find the communities, she can find the content, she can find the opportunities that she needs to advance her leadership, that's the third stage, is curating these opportunities for her, these advanced leadership opportunities to get training to become a journalist, how to run for office, how to start your own NGO, how to um, you know, get your PhD. All of these things are now available online. Uh, that you can do how to get a schol you can get a scholarship online, you can get a grant online, you can get access venture capital online. You, you're going to just have this enormous upward effect where you could literally start getting exponential numbers of women into leadership. We can see two factor, three factor, four factor, five factor expansion of women's leadership by connecting it. And then lastly, my favorite is this collective advocacy. So when you have women, the, these voices online, you are, you can, um, you know, quite quickly get big input into major decisions at the UN, like, or how do we do COVID rapid response in your area? Well, if you have more voices online, you can crowdsource that and you can be more adaptive, responsive, accountable, transparent. Mm -hmm. Many governments now, well, I won't say many, but a few governments are starting feminist foreign policy initiatives. You may have heard of this. Um, you've got Canada, you've got Sweden, you've got Mexico, the US is considering it. There's a bill that's in consideration for a fem, they won't call it that, but a feminist foreign policy that's considering women in our policy. But how are you accountable with our policies as a government? Well online listening. I, I just published an article with Apolitical, which wor works with 26,000 different civil society and policymakers around the world about how we can access women's voices online for decision making, more inclusive decision making. I, the collective advocacy really lights me up. I get really excited about it because I think there's so much potential there as well to rapidly shape um, and solve global problems. So I hope, I hope that answered your question a little bit about how I think we can really speed things up. Yeah, I, it did. Thank you. And uh, apologies for turning my video on and off. My Wi-Fi bandwidth is a little low here. But thanks. Uh, Yin, Sina, we could talk to you all day long, um, but want to um, recognize your time. I've got a couple of questions that you know I'd like to ask uh, as we bring it to a close. So what can we do to support you and World Pulse, Yin, Sina? Mm. Oh, great. Well, um, right now is a really important time. Are you, are you all engaged in discussion around the Generation Equality Forum with the uh, United Nations and you and women that's happening right now? Is that something familiar to this group at all? Well, it's something actually would be great for you to know about because it's a once in a generation opportunity. We're 25 years coming from Beijing where was women's rights or human rights. It was the first platform for women's rights globally. And there, we're now 25, 26 years on. So there's these major governments, private sector, civil society are all coming together to reaffirm that platform, to add new measurements and, and stand in that, including tech. And there's major commitments being made. And there's, uh, I would say it's the defining event of this decade in terms of mass collaboration that's happening around global women's equity. And there's six action coalitions, and there is one. Um, there's gender-based violence, there's technology and innovation, which we're a part of, and there is one on climate justice. So there's some major commitments that are happening right now around climate justice. And I, I'll share with you all the, the, the action items that the leadership committees have come up with and some of that are happening. And um, 
so I think you being aware of that and, and, and this moment around climate justice is, is really key. For World Pulse, we're super intersectional and, and that's why it's been hard for us because we don't fit in any box. We don't, we don't fit in any box around region or topic area. We're fiercely cross-topical and cross-regional. So it's never been easy for us to go and get a grant because the majority of funding happens in silos. Um, we just fund in this region or we just fund in climate change or we just fund in gender-based violence. But for us, it starts with the ingenuity and the leadership of women and girls who are most impacted. And they build solutions that are multifaceted. And they're, so if they're working on a climate initiative, for, for restoration of waterways, they're probably working on reducing violence at the same time <laughs> or economic opportunities. You can't pull it apart. So World Pulse has always set you, know, we have 18 different topic and region hubs, and it's really about your vision and what you're creating. And so you can build connections and networks and access resources around any of the issues. And it's going to create an upward effect um, by strengthening that local, that local leadership. So right now, World Pulse is building a major commitment. It's called the Her Digital Leadership Alliance. And we're working with private sector companies like Vodafone and Salesforce, but we're also working with the government of Germany and um, foundations like the Oak Foundation out of Sweden. And we're building, it's a 3 million commitment over the next three years that's going to activate not only this ma massive network of women digital trainers that I told you about, that I told you about, but it's also going to activate the multiple leadership roles that World Pulse has in our network. We have featured change makers, um, we have featured storytellers and leaders, and so it's going to really strengthen digital leadership of hundreds of thousands of women around the world, and help World Pulse partner with organizations by providing partner portals. Hmm. So those groups that can't build their own platform or their own social network for their members can use World Pulse and have a branded space where they can connect their, um, their membership, but surface the stories and surface the, the resources uh, that are embedded in their own networks and help support social capital. And that's, our, that's a scalable solution that we've developed by doing a listening tour with 60 plus women's rights organizations and how they're struggling with tech. So, so this initiative is going to really provide a, help connect the dots through the global women's movement and help bring train digital training to our many partners who are struggling right now with COVID and the digital transformation that needs to happen. So I would say, you know, check out Generation Equality Forum. When it comes to World Pulse, we're poised to make a, have a major commitment be announced by world leaders. We have opportunity to partner with more companies that care about digital inclusion and digital equity. So if you know companies that might be interested in partnering with us, um, we're working with private donors, of course, as well. We've raised about um, uh, 1.4 million for this particular initiative so far out of the three. And, you know, governments uh, or anybody who wants to be like an advisor or potentially join our global advisory network, um, on our board of directors, we're, we're also building from, PR, from a global PR standpoint, anyone who has expertise in global PR, as well as online, um, scaling online communities. Any, anyone who's actually been, in, been there, done that, built and scaled an online community, we have a, another seat on our board for somebody in that regard. So board members, investors, partners, I'd say those are the, the top three. Excellent. So a couple of questions to bring it to a close. I'll, I'll pose both and just choose where you want to go next. But um, we like to ask all of our guests what your top three calls to action might be and actions that any, any one of us, anyone around the world could take. And then the other question is, what advice would you have for women who are stepping into this space, whether they're uh, taking individual leadership actions or uh, they're leading an organization? So calls to action and advice to women. 
Hmm. Okay. Top three calls to action and then advice to women. Mm. <laughs> I think that the top three calls to action, well, anyone who's involved in social change at this moment or philanthropy investment, I call it build in that 10% digital dividend, that, that, that feminist digital dividend. It's even though you might be working in the issue of climate justice, or you might be like, okay, health is my, is my jam. Well, just recognize that the boost that is gonna come through ensuring that you are, um, if you're working with grassroots leaders that they have access to technology, um, if, or that you're looking at online platforms that are gonna accelerate the work, but just think about technology, that digital dividend as an accelerator investment, a booster investment, a rider, if you will, that's going to lift up everything that you do. So I am I'm asking that mindset shift from people because of the last decade, I keep getting, well, we don't do tech, we don't invest in tech, or we don't use tech as part of our lever of change. And unfortunately, we have um, undervalued um, and we're, we're, we're behind where we could be with tech. We're on the defensive now with the violence that's happening online. So I think that would be one too, if, if we're talking about you know, what anybody can do. I would say it's, it is about that mindset shift, shift your mind from being a victim to your relationship with technology, to the power that you have to bring generosity, empathy, and when you're on an online space, if, if you're feeling hopeless or you're feeling um, depressed, <laughs> or like I'm not doing enough, which happens I think for all of us and we're like, okay, we're online too much. Actually turn the narrative, turn the tide and lift up another woman, lift up somebody else, give a comment, actually give a comment, a positive comment or help make a connection and do just one or two acts of kindness online. Every time you're online, and you're gonna, you're gonna change your relationship to technology. And, and you wouldn't believe in my line of work how transformative just getting a positive comment is, especially to women and girls who are really breaking through to speak out. It, it, they're crying, they're like on the floor, they're like, nobody's ever cared about me before. And I feel that as a CEO who founded a global communication, <laughs> like if I get comments from, women globally and like, oh my gosh, they care what I have to say. So do not underestimate the power that you have to lift up other people online. Just with a small comment, um, it's pretty massive um, on, in that. And then I, I think that, I mean, I would, I would encourage people to come to World Pulse and listen to the voices. If you're wondering, you know, what, what, what's happening in Syria? What's happening in Mexico on the front lines of, of femicide? What's, what's happening in India right now? What can I do? I, I, I think we don't need to wonder. Uh, we, can, we can actually go direct and hear directly from them. And we can, we can support, we can ask them, what do you need? We can build relationships. And I, yes, movements can change the world, through a petition, you can sign an online petition, or you can build deep and meaningful transformative relationships with women leaders from Syria and from India. And you know what? They're gonna lift you up just as much. <laughs> Your life is gonna be richer and better and transformed through it. But that's how true movements and true change get built is through relationships. Amazing. So those are, those are the actions that you could do and then the the way in which as a leader oh my goodness as a social entrepreneur building something i just had to learn the hard way to be gentle with yourself i mean we all always pushing ourselves to be perfect and to push faster harder because the need is so great but um it's, I call it the upward spiral. Building your business or building your initiative is never, ever, ever gonna be a straight line, but it's, it's an upward spiral. And you can drive the spiral through your intuition. So mm -hmm. as you're encountering all these different 
crossroads and pathways, your intuition is number one. And, and so follow your intuition and recognize that you're seeding a garden at the same time. And that your every step that you take, every little thing you do, you're planting, you're planting a seed. And one day <laughs> it's gonna blossom and blossom again in a new way. And then it might, <laughs> you know, get cut down, but it'll bloom again. So it really is this upward spiral of planting a garden. That, that's how I describe it. Wow, you just ended with one of the most powerful things that really resonates with the magnolias because we talk about planting that seed, you know, and, and seeing it grow and then thrive and bloom. And that process happens over and over and over again. You have planted so many seeds with us this morning. I can't thank you enough, Yancina. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. It's, I, I'm excited to have, hopefully this is a beginning to start to spark some synergies with some of the initiatives and projects and the leadership that you have in your work. So uh, consider this an open door and I'll share my slides and I'll share information. I'm sure um, Darcy can pass that information around so we can stay in touch. Wonderful. And thank you so much, Yancina. Thank you so much, Yancina. I just want to say how powerfully impacted I am by your, your strength, your brilliance, but your spirit, your kindness, the way you talk about sacred vision in women, the way you talk about the temple. I think that the combination of those two is such a force for change. And I'm just really appreciative for your time that you've spent with us today. And I really look forward to more, more time with you in the future, hopefully. That would be a blessing for us. Yeah, I, I, I ditto what everyone said. And thank you for having such a audacious, bodacious vision for the world and, and starting where you could and ending where you are so far. So um, I'm just thrilled at what you're doing. Thank you. You are the epitome of a force for good, for goodness. <laughs> well, I love the vision of magnolias. Uh, we're kindred spirits, absolutely. All of us to be, to be dreaming so big. And it, it, the, the time is needed now for all of us, all of us to step forward in community. And that's what you're doing is building community as you go. That's great, yes. Absolutely. This is the decade for change. So I'll end with my roots from Nike. We have to just do it. Just do it. Thank you, Yensina. Enjoy right. the post. Lots of love. Lots of love to everybody. And, and we'll see you online. All right. takes power what happens when she won't back down what happens when a woman takes power what happens what happens what happens when a woman takes power what happens when she won't back down what happens when a woman takes power what happens when she wears the crown what happens when she rules her own body what happens when she sets the what happens when she bows to nobody? What happens when she stands?